With Westworld cancelled, executive producers Jonathan Nolan and Lisa Joy have introduced another world that's sure to be easy to understand with nothing complicated whatsoever. I am so confused right now. The Peripheral, based off the 2014 book by the same name, is a sci-fi time-traveling show that will have you saying... Thank you, sir, man! After every episode, we'll be going over everything from stubs, pults, peripherals, neoprims, the god font, timelines, and antis, so come along with me to the year 2100, where London still looks like crap and even the sex robots won't talk to me. The final episode of the season is called The Creation of a Thousand Forests, which is actually a quote from Ralph Waldo Emerson, which reads, The creation of a thousand forests is in one acorn. This is in reference to protagonist Flynn Fisher, whose mother says their father always called her their little acorn. Because although an acorn may be little, it holds immense power, being able to turn into a mighty oak tree. We don't know much about Flynn's father, although Flynn has fond memories of him, even using a sim to replay cherished home videos. In a show where infinite worlds are possible, married with the fact we've never seen her father's face, I wouldn't be surprised if this character is somehow brought into the show. To really understand what's going on, we have to start where it all began. Flynn's brother, Burton, was chosen by a secretive Colombian company called Milan Agro's cold iron to test out a new virtual reality headset. This was due to his impressive skills in a game called Halcyon. We actually see a little bit of this game in the first episode when Flynn takes on a bunch of Nazis. But little does this company know that it wasn't actually Burton getting these high scores, but his sister Flynn. So they ship him this new headset and Burton convinces his sister to take over for him. The better they do in the game, the more money they'll earn. And with their mother's health in decline and pain medication sorely needed, this is a great opportunity opportunity for Flynn to rake in some extra cash. Flynn is teleported to a futuristic London where the headset makes her feel like she's really there. The big twist, however, is that this is not a game at all, but that she's essentially piloting a robot in the actual future. These robots are called peripherals and are basically vessels one can take over using this headset. They can be controlled by people in the past or the present. For example, when Flynn takes control of a peripheral, she's called a Polt. Short for Poltergeist because she is essentially essentially a ghost inhabiting this robotic body. In this future, roughly 70 years from Flynn's present, Flynn is likely dead, hence this ghost-like analogy. Peripherals can also be controlled by those in the present. For example, Charisse uses one to protect herself from harm when she fights Flynn. The guards at the stub portals also use peripherals, allowing the locations of such portals be simultaneously guarded, but their locations kept secret. By putting on the headset, Flynn takes control of a peripheral that looks like her brother. Remember the company that gave gave him the headset thought he was going to be the one putting it on, thus they made him a peripheral to match. But as we'll soon find out, this shell company is actually run by a woman named Alita West, who's at the center of season one's story. Alita has Flynn attend an upscale party for a company called the Research Institute. It's one of three major pillars that hold society from the brink of collapse after a series of catastrophic events known as the Jackpot. These are a collection of events that resulted in the downfall of society, and they include things Things like the hacking of the North American electrical grid, plagues, environmental catastrophes, and even the launch of a nuclear bomb. It is said that over four decades, seven billion people were killed. Out of this chaos emerged a mafia-type organization called the Klept Oligarchy. They managed to bring some stability to areas of the world like London, but to keep the Klept in check, the second pillar emerged, the Metropolitan Police, and the third pillar is the Research Institute itself, which seeks to provide technical assistance assistance to society so that it can function and thrive. Alita does not belong to any of these pillars, rather to a rogue group of revolutionaries known as the Neoprims, who the Kleps and others see as terrorists. Their goal is to have London burn and build something new from its ashes. But how can a group with almost no power seek to overthrow a society that controls everything? That's where Alita's plan involving Flynn kicks in. A year before Alita disappears, she meets up with an ex-lover, Dr. Grace Hogarth. Both of them work for the Research Institute, however, Grace in a far more secretive department. Grace, against all protocol, shows Alita the secret projects she's been working on over the years, one that allows the Research Institute to alter events in the past. By altering the past, they can find ways to prevent future cataclysmic events. However, as we'll find out, Dr. Sharice Newland, the head of the Research Institute, seems to have more nefarious plans. To try to make things as easy to understand as possible, we're going to focus on two timelines. First, we have what I like to call the future or original timeline. This is the one that went through all those catastrophes and got us to London in the year 2100. It's in the future. 
where he is. 2100. In this timeline, technology was created in the late 2080s that allowed humanity to access the past. This isn't your normal time travel like a Back to the Future where the user himself is teleported. Think of it more as a transference of data than of a person. This transference also allows people from the future to communicate with those in the past via things like phones. And every time a change is made in the past from someone in the future, a stub is created, an alternate parallel timeline or world. Think of it like a branch forming from the trunk of a tree. A stub is created any time a change is made in the past, allowing infinite stubs to be created. One such stub is Flynn's. In this original future timeline, Flynn went on to marry Sheriff Tommy Constantine and have two children. Her brother Burton was actually killed in combat and their friend Connor didn't lose an arm and legs. What we see in the show, however, is Flynn living one of these alternate timelines or stubs. In this one, Burton lives, Connor loses most of his limbs, and Flynn never marries Tommy. So what happened here? Alita learns from Grace Hogarth that the research institute was secretly using stubs to test out technology that could control the chemistry in people's brains. They did this by setting up a shell company in the past, bidding on US military contracts, and installing haptic implants in military personnel. Burton and his friends had these haptic implants installed, which resulted in the research institute messing with these soldiers' compassion levels. This is why Connor risks his own life to save the injured dog, the one that will eventually get him blown up. The research institute messed with the chemicals in his brain. Theoretically, if the research institute could manipulate all of our brains into being more compassionate, it could end violence as we know it. This gets at why Dr. Sharice Newland has set up this secret program in the first place. As she tells Inspector Ainsley Lobier in Episode 7, most of the jackpot stuff that happened was because of humanity's resistance to one human trait a persistent self-destructive resistance to acting for a collective good. In her mind, if we could make people more compassionate, we could avoid the very tragedies that befell us in the past. The Research Institute already has implants in almost everybody, so if word got out that they were working on a program to control people, it would not be a good look. Hence, while she'll stop at nothing to get control of Alita, who has somehow managed to steal this program's data. Alita's plan was to have Burton seduce Mariel Raphael, a member of the Research Institute's secret program, have her eye taken out and put into his body. This way they could access the retina scanner at the God Font, a device which allows the user access to stubs, and have this data downloaded into Burton's haptic system. The only problem is it's not Burton who's controlling the peripheral, it's Flynn who doesn't have a haptic system. Thus the headset translated the data into bacterial DNA which started to colonize her brain. Don't ask me how this works, it's just one of those things the show expects you to go along with. This is why Flynn has no idea why people are after her. They say she stole something, but she has no idea what she stole. And it's this data's overtaking of her brain which gives her side effects like that weird Hulk grip and sporadic seizures. This brings us to the final episode, where Ainsley Lobier finds herself in a difficult predicament. Side with Charisse or with Flynn? As a senior inspector of the Metropolitan Police, she has tremendous power and learned of Charisse's abuse of the stub. Charisse tried to convince her that everything she was doing was for the common good. Should the Neoprims or the Klept get a hold of this stub which contains the data to their mind control program, something they call a neural adjustment mechanism, it would be disastrous. On the other hand, Lobier could work with Flynn. This seems to be her choice at the end of the season, when she states that they have work to do. But her motivations on why she chooses Flynn are vague. Ash, one of Lev's hackers, even says Lobier has her own agenda. All we learn from Lobier is that Flynn has the capacity to work in her world in ways which are beyond her. If I were to take a guess, this has something to do with her daughter Beatrice. In episode 7, we learn Beatrice is likely an AI based off her own daughter. In return for her help, Flynn wants a medication to help her dying mother. But when Lobier consults the Aunties, she's informed there is nothing that can help her, and they give her 23 days to live. The Aunties are the Metropolitan Police's data sorting algorithm, which can be used to store information to make assumptions about the future. Ash tells Charisse that the data she's been looking for this entire season is stored in Flynn's brain. Ash, who is working
looking for Sharice's nemesis, Lev Zubov has switched sides after Lev slashed Ossian's face. In exchange for this information, she wants Lev killed. So Sharice knows she must kill Flynn even if it means destroying decades worth of research. And she'll do this by altering conditions in her stub so that the jackpot comes earlier, specifically a nuclear attack that could wipe out her hometown. Later in the episode, Tommy asks Flynn if she knows anything about a recent warning from the Department of Homeland Security regarding a terrorist threat to a nuclear missile silo near where they live. It seems as though Sharice's plan is well underway. Meanwhile, Flynn and Wilf continue their search for Alita, eventually heading to the place where Wilf and Alita grew up and called their secret place. There he finds a young robotic or peripheral version of her, the same one we saw at the beginning of episode one. It's interesting to note that in the scene from episode one, her goal is to save the world, but not their world. Saving the world. Our world is long past saving. I thought that was always your point. But I didn't say our world. She leads him to the camp where they first met and talks about how the ground underneath them are filled with thousands of bodies. He doesn't even remember the death of his mother, sisters, or brother because the implant inside him also suppresses these memories. Elita took hers out and memories came flooding back. However, taking it out also means losing your immunity boost to whatever seems to be plaguing the world around them. You may have noticed these giant sculptures with air turbines on them. All we know is that they're called air scrubbers and capture capture carbon from the atmosphere, so it appears that global warming is but another catastrophe included in the jackpot. I also like how these scrubbers are in the form of classical sculptures, which symbolize order among chaos, much like classical painting and music brought uniformity and order. The implants that suppress memories work in the favor of the klept, who massacred millions of survivors for fear they were spreading contagion. By stopping these memories, the klept could prevent discontent and potential uprising. Now, Lita has assembled a, quote, army of the dispossessed, but they can't possibly take on the Research Institute and Klept on their own. The secret to bringing them down lies in Flynn's head. I should also briefly mention the setup for Jasper's takeover of Corbell Pickett's narcotic operation. With Corbell seemingly on death's door, Jasper has to put up with getting squeezed out of the operation, so he puts his drunk friends on a railroad, but at the last minute changes his mind. Remember this is a guy whose wife said he'd never heard a fly. Unfortunately, it's too late, and before Jasper can rescue them, a train kills everyone in the car. This made me think of young Jasper, who grew up watching his uncle Corbell kill members of a motorcycle gang in a heated car. For as Corbell says, hey, You won't get anywhere in life, Jasper, if you don't have the courage to be cruel now and then. Will Jasper become this cruel person, or will his empathy give in? We know empathy has been a big theme of the series. Meanwhile, Flynn comes up with a radical plan to stop Sharice from blowing up a nuclear bomb near her hometown. This plan involves making Sharice think that Flynn's been killed. Here's where things get muddy, since the show doesn't really give us straight answers, but this is what I think happens, and you can let me know in the comments if I'm way off base. First, we know that Lowbeer can create new stubs, and that Flynn wants to hide in one. If she could have that precious data downloaded to her from the future, is it not possible she could have it uploaded there? This means it's entirely possible Flynn could have that data transferred to a version of herself in a different stub. More likely, however, is that this new stub acts like a save point in a video game. In the original stub, she'll be killed by Connor, but in the new one, she'll have the same data instilled in her brain. So if Connor did actually kill her at the end, it means Flynn sacrificed herself so that everyone in her world wouldn't be nuked, and that this new Flynn can carry on the task of taking down Charisse and the Klept. Now, we actually never see her die, we just hear the gunshot go off, but let me know what you guys think happened. This pocket watch is also confusing. It seems to act as some sort of key allowing the creation of new stubs. It certainly sounds like she destroys this pocket watch in the end, but we know there are always other ways into a stub. The show does not end there. In a post credit scene, Lev Zubov, who was supposed to be attending an event with his father, is surprised to see other high members of the Klept in his place. They want to cut any affiliation with Flynn's stub and kill anyone associated with it. Not just that, but quote, the whole tree, which which implies any and all stubs. This means Flynn's world, which we thought would have been saved, is still in jeopardy, as well as the new stub with the data in it. It also implies anyone involved with Lev, including Wilf, Ash, and Ossian, will need to be killed as well. If Lev doesn't clean this up, it's heavily implied his wife and children will be killed. My mind is utterly scrambled from this show, but now I want to hear from you. What did you think of the peripheral season one, and what are your theories? Leave them in the comments below. Thanks for watching, everyone. 
make sure to like and subscribe. And for more bad takes, you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at ThinkStoryYT. Until next time, remember... I am so confused right now.